Welcome aboard the mighty aircraft carrier, a city at sea, home to over 6,000 dedicated sailors. As a testament to American power, the U.S. Navy deploys these colossal vessels on vital missions worldwide. Navigating high-stakes operations, the men and women aboard tackle immense challenges, from the complexities of daily operations to the emotional hardship of being far from home. With unyielding determination, they ensure our security and freedom, pushing the limits of human potential every day. So join us as we take you on a journey into the heart of the aircraft carrier. From the bustling flight deck to the galley, we'll uncover the sacrifices made and the grit it takes to operate this giant ship, along with the sacrifices that sailors make every day in service to their country. Weighing in at over 100,000 tons, an aircraft carrier is no ordinary ship. It's a floating fortress, a symbol of naval might. Its flight deck is a lifeline for airborne operations. Speeding across the ocean at over 35 knots, it carries the hopes and dreams of an entire nation. These massive vessels are stationed worldwide, ready to deploy at a moment's notice. And when they do, it's not just the ship's sheer size that leaves an impression, it's the frantic motion of activity on the flight deck. Just imagine witnessing jets being launched and landed every 25 seconds. It's truly a testament to the meticulous organization and unyielding dedication. What's interesting is that despite being far out into the ocean, these carriers become self-sustained communities operating with undying efficiency. But access is restricted, secrets hidden beneath the highest levels of the island. The flight deck, hangar, and fantail offer breathtaking views but are also teeming with danger. Only a privileged few are granted entry during normal operations, protecting the integrity and security of the ship. And yet, amidst the controlled chaos, the aircraft carrier houses facilities akin to those found on land. The ship's interior hides countless corridors, echoing with footsteps and the hum of machinery. Below decks, sailors toil away, sometimes going weeks without glimpsing daylight. But despite the challenges and constraints, life on an aircraft carrier is a unique adventure, full of camaraderie and shared purpose. With all this, let's not forget that the thousands of sailors on board need nutritious food in order to stay active, fit, and strong. It raises the question, how does a ship in the middle of the ocean cater food to such a big number of sailors on board? Food has been a cornerstone of the U.S. Navy since its inception, playing a vital role in recruitment and retention of sailors. In the early days of naval exploration, a hearty meal was essential to entice people to join the crew and embark on dangerous and arduous journeys. The physical demands of sailing ships required a substantial caloric intake to maintain the crew's health and well-being, and a well-fed crew was often the difference between success and failure on long voyages across the open sea. So judging by this, providing sustenance to the crew of an aircraft carrier is a monumental undertaking that demands exceptional coordination and the skills of a highly talented team. Just imagine a group of over 100 sailors working tirelessly to feed everyone on board this small city. They are responsible for preparing an astonishing number of meals each day a task that would appear to be an insurmountable challenge were it not for their culinary wizardry. As naval technology advanced, so did the communal dining halls or messes where sailors could come together and share a meal. Today, these messes remain the primary means of feeding groups of service members, fostering a sense of camaraderie and community among those who serve at sea. But where does this culinary magic happen? Step into the galley to see the chefs at work creating gastronomic miracles. Unrated sailors, bakers, chefs, butchers, and a chief commissary steward 
make up the group in charge of efficiency managing the galley. The galley is a self-contained universe within its own kitchen, a dedicated area for preparing meat, and even a complete bakery. Every piece of equipment is specifically designed to handle the massive volumes of food needed to sustain the crew, from the enormous bandsaws that can slice through entire sides of meat to the industrial ovens that can bake bread and steamers for cooking vegetables. All of these features work together to guarantee that every sailor on board is well nourished. For this, there's a team of about 93 skilled culinary specialists working tirelessly to produce an astounding number of meals each day, around 16,000 to 18,000 to be exact. From the early morning breakfast at 6 a.m., to the late night mid rats to keep the crew fueled, the galley is essentially in operation around the clock. The ship's cooks adhere to a carefully crafted 15 day menu cycle, ensuring a variety of delicious meals that keep the crew satisfied and energized. And that's not all. The galley remains well stocked throughout the journey thanks to a regular resupply of both dry and fresh commodities carried out at sea. Imagine the incredible feat of keeping a floating kitchen operational and fully stocked for months on end in the middle of the vast ocean. It's really a testament to the culinary specialist's ability to meet the demands of the crew. But then comes another important piece of the puzzle, time. Time management is crucial in the galley. Navy culinary specialists must be masters of their craft and efficient managers of time. They wake up at 3 a.m. ensuring breakfast is ready at 6 a.m. They juggle various responsibilities while constantly preparing meals. Training and adaptability are essential as they face the challenges of working long, unusual hours. It also goes without saying that sailors need some facilities we take for granted on land since they spend most of their time at sea. But fear not! as the U.S. Navy has gone to great efforts to ensure that its sailors have all they require, safeguarding their physical well-being and maintaining a high level of morale to do their tasks successfully. The amenities on board an aircraft carrier are truly remarkable. There are other facilities in addition to the excellent food and laundry facilities. Prepare to be wowed as in fact, there is a whole grocery store on board. This establishment is not just a mere convenience, to say the least. It is a crucial requirement for an aircraft carrier. It not only offers a range of goodies and snacks to boost morale, but it also gives sailors access to necessities like food, hygiene products, and razors. Some of these essentials are provided by the Navy, but occasionally sailors need particular products that are readily available in stores. Ultimately, you will see sailors enjoying protein shakes, potatoes, candy, chocolate, and various types of coffee, all available to cater to their needs and comfort. Who, you may wonder, is responsible for running this convenience store? Enter the Retail Service Specialist. These dedicated individuals are in charge of not only managing the grocery store, but also overseeing various other operations on the aircraft carrier. They're also in charge of ordering and stocking merchandise, maintaining inventory records, and managing cash and credit transactions. Fun fact, they were formerly known as ship servicemen but were given their new title back in 2019. In addition to managing the retail operations, retail service specialists also play an important role in providing morale-boosting services to the crew. Now, what happens if the grocery store runs out of stock? Well, it really isn't much of an issue. The process is much like any land-based grocery store. They simply restock their supplies. But here's where things get intriguing. You must be wondering, how can they achieve this feat in the middle of the vast ocean? The US Navy has a remarkable procedure called replenishment at sea. It involves the transfer of fuel, ammunition, stores, and grocery items from one ship to another while both ships are still in motion. Yeah, you heard that right. It's an artful procedure of resupplying that has been developed since the early days of the 20th century. So you see, life aboard an aircraft carrier goes beyond the battles and missions. It's a self-contained world with amenities that cater to the needs and well-being of its sailors. 
The grocery store plays a vital role, ensuring that the sailors have access to a wide array of goods, while the remarkable process of replenishment at sea keeps the shelves stocked and the crew taken care of. Picture this, the roaring ocean, ships in perpetual motion, and the sky buzzing with helicopters. This is the world of vertical replenishment, where resupplying ships becomes an aerial symphony. Cargo bounces between delivering and receiving ships, effortlessly transported by those mighty rotary wings. The beauty of this method lies in its speed and efficiency, where stock transfers become a high-flying art form. No need for vessels to dangerously approach each other, for the helicopters bridge the gap. However, like any grand performance, limitations do exist. The capacity of these airborne workhorses places constraints on load size and transfer speeds, making them a less suitable choice for grand-scale resupply operations. Regardless, let's now turn our attention to the state-of-the-art aircraft carriers of today, along with the modern replenishment methods that they employ, alongside connected replenishment, otherwise known as CONRAP. Using this method, the transfer of vital resources between ships takes on a different form, with fuel, fresh water, ammunition, and provisions flowing through interconnected veins during transit. To facilitate this process, the U.S. Navy in the 1950s and 60s developed a fleet of multi-product supply ships capable of providing these essential resources while underway. To ensure a smooth and seamless flow, a transfer system that uses a powerful ram tensioner known as STREAM was developed. This method stretches the distance between ships, allowing for greater operational flexibility. Now, imagine the stage set, where the supply ship becomes the maestro, orchestrating a constant direction and speed. A steady rhythm, typically ranging from 12 to 16 knots, keeps the vessels in harmony. This tempo minimizes the disruptive sway induced by the mighty waves, offering better control and smoother transfer between ships. It's a delicate balance where skill and precision meet the ebb and flow of the ocean's heartbeat. These replenishment techniques were developed out of necessity during World War II and were instrumental in revolutionizing naval logistics. They enabled the U.S. Navy to maintain a continuous presence at sea even in the most challenging environments. From the precision of vertical replenishment where supplies are hoisted to and from a helicopter in mid-air, to the efficiency of alongside connected replenishment where ships are connected by hoses and lines, these methods were critical in sustaining fleet readiness and ensuring mission success. As the receiving ship steers towards the supply vessel closing into a distance of approximately 30 yards, a moment of anticipation hangs in the air. It is at this point that the supplier unleashes the power of a gun line pneumatic line thrower, which is also known as a shot line. This propelled line becomes the bridge that connects the two vessels. Along this lifeline, other essential equipment is hauled across, including the likes of distance lines, phone lines, and transfer rig lines. During this crucial process of replenishment, it is the supply ship that takes center stage. It serves as the command ship, responsible for providing all the necessary lines and equipment for seamless transfer between vessels. Like a maestro directing multiple movements, larger ships often set up multiple transfer rigs, allowing for swifter transfers or the handling of various supplies. And not to mention, most ships are designed with the capacity to handle two receivers simultaneously restocking one from each side, yet it's worth noting that aircraft carriers in the U.S. Navy ships always receive replenishments on the starboard side. The layout of an aircraft carrier with the island and the navigation bridge positioned on the starboard side prohibits the use of the carrier's port side for replenishment. Now, let's talk about the delicate balance between safety and risk during this process. Alongside connected replenishment carries its share of dangers, when two or three ships travel side by side at speed, they must maintain a precise path and velocity for an extended duration. The hydrodynamics at play generates a suction effect between the ships, adding to the complexity. 
Even a minor miscalculation or steering error from any vessel could lead to a collision or, worse yet, the rupture of gasoline transfer lines and hoses. A small change in heading, as little as one degree at a speed of 12 knots, can result in a lateral speed of around 20 feet per minute. Thus, skilled helmsmen, with their experience and qualifications, become crucial during the replenishment process. The bridge crew must be fully devoted to the ship's trajectory and speed, leaving no room for distraction. Of course, with the heightened risk, preparations for emergencies are imperative. Crews diligently practice emergency breakaway procedures to ensure that, even in less than optimal situations, the ships can swiftly separate, avoiding destructive collisions. Though collisions may be averted, there is always the possibility that the ships may be unable to complete the transfer at hand, resulting in the loss of some goods. Nonetheless, following a successful replenishment procedure, a sense of accomplishment fills the air, knowing that the vital task has been fulfilled. Up top, on the flight deck, a symphony of activity unfolds. It's a place where roles and responsibilities intertwine, and each person plays their part in the grand performance. Among the key players are the aircraft handling personnel, entrusted with the delicate task of moving aircraft across the flight deck. With precise hand signals and verbal commands, they guide the aircraft into position for takeoff and landing. Alongside them, the aircraft maintenance personnel diligently tend to the needs of these mighty flying machines. They perform routine maintenance, carry out inspections, and address repairs as necessary. From servicing engines to inspecting and replacing components, their skilled hands ensure that the aircraft are ready to soar with confidence. But let's not forget the flight deck operations personnel, who bear the weight of managing the overall safety and coordination of the flight deck. They orchestrate the movement of aircraft, directing traffic, and ensuring smooth launch and recovery cycles. In this high-stakes environment, their expertise and vigilance maintain order amidst the controlled chaos. You may be curious about the sight of sailors kneeling near the aircraft as it readies for takeoff. The flank deck of an aircraft carrier is considered one of the most dangerous workplaces on the planet. It presents significant challenges due to the constant roar of engines and the presence of multiple planes and personnel in a relatively confined space. Despite the seemingly chaotic scene, there is a well-coordinated system of operations on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. Kneeling near an aircraft has a specific purpose and meaning. For instance, a sailor wearing a yellow shirt is responsible for giving the signal to the cat crew to initiate the catapult launch. In contrast, a sailor in a green shirt is part of the cat crew, awaiting the next aircraft to be fired from the catapult. The colors of the shirts indicate various roles, such as quality assurance team member or a final checker, tasked with ensuring that everything is in order before the launch. But before an aircraft can take flight, meticulous inspections are carried out. The U.S. Navy is thorough in their pre-flight procedures. These inspections include checking for hydraulic or fuel leaks and identifying any other apparent issues that need fixing. In the box of the deck, positioned between the catapults, a group of 10 individuals form the cat crew, accompanied by members of the Ordnance Department and the QA final checkers. Their collective efforts ensure that all systems are go and the aircraft can take to the skies with confidence. This goes to show how organized the entire ordeal really is. Within this organized chaos, gestures and signs become the sailor's language essentially becoming their means of effective communication amidst the deafening noise generated by the carrier. It is through this intricate coordination and cooperation that the flight deck of a U.S. Navy carrier operates with a highly rare chance of anything going wrong. Also, it's important to understand that in order to maintain clarity and avoid misinterpretation, standardized hand signals are employed, which as a result ensures uniformity across launches and recoveries. This consistency is vital, as even a slight misunderstanding 
can have disastrous consequences in such a high-stakes situation. So once everything is checked off and the pilot is ready for takeoff, they signal their readiness to the plane captain with a thumbs-up gesture, indicating their preparedness to embark on their aerial journey. This is where the presence of a yellow-shirted director becomes pivotal, as their authority is required for any aircraft movement on the flight deck. These directors oversee and regulate the aircraft's actions, whether it be taxiing or being towed, and it goes without saying how important this role really is. When it comes to hand signals, there is a distinction between those communicated to the pilots and those intended for other members of the flight deck. Signals directed at the pilots are performed above the waist, ensuring clear visibility, while those meant for other deck personnel are executed below the waist. The breakdown of the aircraft commences after the thumbs-up signal, with sweeping arm motions indicated the removal of the chocks and chains that secure the plane. Once disassembled, taxi signals guide the aircraft's movement across the flight deck. In the aviation realm, waving the arms signifies taxiing, while bending one arm conveys the intention to turn. All maneuvers are executed when the engines are idle to prevent excessive thrust that could endanger personnel around the aircraft itself. Yellow shirts guiding aircraft during taxiing must remain stationary while the aircraft approaches. The responsibility is then transferred to the next director through a pointing gesture, indicating the direction to follow. Predetermined routes, directions, and sequences of airplanes are meticulously controlled by the handler in flight deck control, with contingency plans in place for any unforeseen circumstances. Then, upon finally reaching the catapult, the aircraft receives a signal to spread its wings, demonstrated by a sweeping motion of the arms. The director then extends one arm forward, indicating the release of the launch bar. While it may appear provocative, rest assured it is a precise gesture that ensures proper alignment between the launch bar and the catapult shuttle. For aircraft armed with munitions, an ORDI, also known as a red shirt, plays a critical role. They provide a hands-up signal, ensuring the pilot's arms remain visible throughout the potentially risky process. The ORDIs then communicate the arm-up signal by extending both arms forward and placing one fist within the other palm. Red shirts have a pretty dangerous responsibility, as managing or handling any sort of ammunition comes with stress and anxiety. But they're meticulously trained and well experienced to ensure everything plays out in a safe manner. With the aircraft armed and ready, it can taxi onto the catapult and begin taking tension. This phase requires substantial power to overcome the resistance caused by the whole backfitting located on the rear of the nose gear. As the aircraft taxis, the signal for taking tension is given, indicating the commencement of the catapult launch. During this phase, the pilot must maintain precise control of the aircraft to ensure that it remains properly aligned with the catapult and that the launch sequence proceeds smoothly. The taking of tension is a critical moment in the launch process, as it sets the aircraft in motion towards a successful launch. This is a good time to discuss what happens when an aircraft makes it back to the carrier. The first step in the recovery process is for the pilot to establish visual contact with the carrier and make a series of radio calls to the landing signal officer, otherwise referred to as a yellow shirt, who provides guidance to the pilot during the approach and landing. Once the pilot has been cleared to land, the aircraft begins its descent toward the flight deck. As an aircraft approaches the landing spot, the yellow shirt stands to the pilot's right, signaling the reduction of throttle by tugging a thumb backward. Following a successful landing, the hookup signal is conveyed by bringing one thumb into the open palm of the other hand, indicating readiness for maintenance. The aircraft then maneuvers through various taxing procedures until the yellow shirt passes the signal to install the necessary chocks and chains in order to well secure the aircraft in place. Ultimately, the aircraft is entrusted to the plane's captain, ensuring a smooth transition and proper handling of the aircraft. Amidst the bustling activity on the flight deck, sailors can be seen scurrying about while wearing earplugs to protect themselves from the deafening noise. However, certain officers enjoy a unique vantage point from one of the smallest rooms on an aircraft carrier, known as the bubble. 
The bubble houses the Integrated Catapult Control System, otherwise known as the ICCS, which is a crucial station found on today's modern U.S. Navy aircraft carrier's flight decks. The ICCS plays a vital role in launching aircraft with enhanced safety and improved efficiency. It serves as the central hub of the catapult control system, eliminating the need for multiple remote stations and complex intercommunications for each aircraft takeoff. Given the potential risks and the need for flawless coordination, the officer assigned to the bubble carries significant responsibility. Consider it a control station where crucial aspects of aircraft activity are handled. Before each launch, the sailor in the bubble conducts meticulous safety checks. Once inside the bubble, they ensure favorable wind conditions, confirming a clear path for the aircraft. They keep a vigilant eye on the control board in front of them, monitoring critical parameters. Just moments before takeoff, the sailor observes the pilot, looking for head movements or light switches. This visual communication is particularly crucial during night operations as the pilot's actions can determine whether the takeoff proceeds or is delayed for safety reasons. Note how a substantial amount of communication is non-verbal. This is especially because of the loud atmosphere on the flight deck. The roar of jet engines, the whine of hydraulic machinery, and the clanging of metal on metal combine to create an unbearable noise which sailors have to protect their ears from. They do this by wearing specialized ear protection, such as noise-canceling headphones or earplugs, which can reduce the impact of the loud noise on their hearing while still allowing them to communicate effectively with each other and carry out their duties. Anyway, from this compact yet pivotal space, the officer in the bubble fulfills their critical role in maintaining the smooth and secure operations of the aircraft catapult launches. Their unwavering focus and attention to detail contribute to the overall safety and success of aircraft operations on the carrier's dynamic flight deck. Okay, let's transition to a lighter element of life on board a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier. Here's a question for you. Have you ever heard of swim call? What do you think it means on a carrier out in the ocean? Well, a swim call is a recreational activity for the sailors that sometimes is allowed when the ship is in a safe and secure location. During this phase, sailors and other personnel are allowed to jump into the water and swim for a period of time, providing a much-needed break from the stressful life on board. Participating in a swim call is voluntary, and sailors who choose to participate are required to follow certain guidelines. They may be required to wear life jackets or other safety equipment, and they're instructed to stay within the designated swimming area. The duration of swim call is typically limited, and sailors are required to return to the ship promptly when it's over. Swim calls serve as one of the few morale-boosting activities for sailors who spend extended periods at sea. They provide a temporary respite from the demanding and sometimes stressful environment aboard an aircraft carrier. It allows sailors to relax, have fun, and enjoy a sense of normalcy amidst their duties. In the past, when the U.S. Navy sailors set out on their voyages, they rarely had the luxury of bathing due to the limited supply of water on board. However, they were able to take advantage of swim calls to indulge in a refreshing dip in the ocean. Over time, these swim calls have evolved into much-needed breaks for the hard-working crew members of modern-day vessels. These breaks are essential for sailors to catch their breath, release some pent-up stream, and strike a balance between their regular shipboard duties. One very important thing to note is that before the swim call is even allowed, the ship's crew will conduct a series of safety checks and protocols to ensure that the area is clear of any potential hazards, such as marine life or debris. The seawater injection temperature becomes the litmus test, determining if it's time to notify all departments aboard the carrier. But let's not kid ourselves. Navigating these swim calls doesn't always result in optimal conditions. Sometimes, our brave crew members aboard submarines find themselves participating in this age-old naval tradition amidst icy and bone-chilling waters. It's a testament to their resilience and unwavering spirit. Meanwhile, the area for swimming is carefully monitored and safety boats and lifeguards are present on standby to respond to any emergencies. Despite the challenges, a swim call remains a highly sought-after event. And the fun doesn't stop there. 
these sailors occasionally engage in whimsical competitions, injecting an extra dose of excitement. Laughter and camaraderie fill the air as they create lasting memories amid the salty depths. During a swim call, they can leap off some of the elevators in the hangar bay, reaching heights of up to 30 feet, equivalent to a standard Olympic diving platform. Precision is paramount as they plunge gracefully into the ocean, ensuring they break the water's surface without breaking any bones. After enjoying a well-deserved break during a swim call, sailors must return to the ship, often using cargo nets that are skillfully deployed by the bosun mates or the ship's landing docks. These moments add an extra touch of tradition and honor to swim call experience. The sailors demonstrate their agility and teamwork while returning to the ship. Another beloved tradition on naval vessels is the Steel Beach Party. Yep, you heard that right. These festive events are held on the flight deck, where sailors enjoy music and the aroma of barbecues wafting through the air. Sponsored by various shipboard departments, Steel Beach Parties also bring a sense of unity and enjoyment to the crew. It's a time to relax and connect with fellow sailors, all while basking in the warmth of the sea and enjoying the unique experience of life on a naval vessel. However, when things get serious, every sailor aboard a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier knows exactly what to do. You must not forget that the carrier is under constant threat every second it's out at sea. Naturally, there are instances where enemy threats are encountered, and that's when the crew must respond quickly and decisively to protect the ship and its personnel. In the event of an enemy threat, the ship's air wing will launch a defensive response, which may involve intercepting and engaging enemy aircraft, launching anti-ship missiles, or deploying electronic warfare systems to disrupt enemy communications and radar. Alongside the air wing, the ship's crew will take various defensive measures. This may include deploying countermeasures such as chaff and flares to confuse enemy missiles, activating the ship's close-in weapon systems, also known as the CIWS, to shoot down incoming threats, and going into a state of heightened readiness. During this time, personnel will man their battle stations, seal off certain areas of the ship, conduct damage control drills, and ensure that all systems are operational and ready for action. This coordinated effort aims to ensure that the mission is accomplished without incurring damage, injuries, or casualties. And as the sun gracefully sets on another day of service, we find ourselves in awe of the brave men and women who proudly serve in the U.S. Navy. From the magnificent flight decks of aircraft carriers to the mysterious depths explored by our submarines, their unwavering dedication and hard work safeguard the freedoms we hold dear. It is an honor and a privilege to share their remarkable stories and pay homage to their exceptional service. To all the gallant sailors of the U.S. Navy, we extend our heartfelt gratitude. You are the pride of the seas, the protectors of our nation. And for that, we salute you. Thank you for your unwavering commitment to duty. If you were to step into the shoes of these brave people for a day, which specific job or duty on board the carrier do you think would test your limits to the most? Tell us in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed what you saw and learned something new, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating content about the U.S. Navy. We appreciate your support and hope to see you again soon. Be sure to hit the bell icon so you can tune in to our next video right on time.